Hello, this is Steve Woods. Today I would like to show you a powerful approach to migrating your entire portfolio into the cloud using Pivotal's Application Analyzer. We call it Forensic Analysis. You've seen all those police procedurals where the lab technician nails the bad guys, right? And you may have heard of Adam Tornhill's excellent book, Your Code as a Crime Scene. Same premise. Adam suggests finding clues in your application's composition by harvesting source code change logs. Excellent approach. Well, we're going to take that a step further. We're going to harvest your source code's DNA. Okay, all living creatures have DNA. It's what makes us who we are. You can even have your DNA tested. It'll speak to your ancestry and even your potential medical issues. You can even have your pet's DNA tested. And both results can be very surprising. So, until you have your app's DNA tested, well, you never know. Your apps can be like an enigma, wrapped in a puzzle. I call this inscrutable. I know, I know, it's an uncommon word, but it really fits. Think about it. Is your app incapable of being investigated? How can you possibly evaluate that much code? Is it physically impenetrable? If you can't get an actionable point of view, can you really say you understand the problem? Maybe your portfolio really is inscrutable. But why is this so? Well, here's the bad news, and these numbers really are a bit scary. Your average portfolio has about a thousand applications, and you know you have to evaluate every single one. That's about five million lines of code. And it's like Forrest Gump said, it's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Our list of patterns currently stand at about 800 critical patterns that you need to evaluate in order to understand the suitability for clouds and all the work you're going to have to do. And wow, doing that math, it's about 4 trillion pattern matches. Ouch, this could take a while. But here's the good news. That laptop on your desk is an amazing device. It has eight high-speed CPUs. You may never have experienced your laptop being pushed to the limit. But when you run PAA, expect all the fans inside your laptop to kick in to cool down all those saturated CPUs. So how does PAA accomplish this? When we designed and developed PAA, we had your needs in mind. We know, we get it, your source code is sensitive. It's your competitive edge, so it will never leave your premises. To make this happen, we wrote PAA in the Go language. That's right, the same language Docker uses. By using Go, we made PAA highly parallel. Why? Because scanning source code is a special type of problem. It's called embarrassingly parallel. No, really, that's actually a computer science term. Look it up. It means there's a huge opportunity here to exploit parallel processing. We also wanted to be able to extend and add rules without rebuilding PAA. So the rules, they're just YAML. That means they're easily expanded and edited. These rules were created by some of our most talented and experienced architects. They've been tuned and adapted to dozens of customers in a wide range of verticals. It's like having all this expertise looking over your shoulders. Yes, we currently support Java and C Sharp, but we're adding support all the time. We're currently working on C++. Of course, it's Go, so PAA runs on OS X, Windows, and Linux. It's just a single file, a single executable, no installation required. And, in keeping with our one executable to rule them all philosophy, from that same executable, we built a browser-based reporting and visualization tool. Still, we've not gone beyond your firewall. Your source code is safe. And the most important criteria of all, PAA scales to very large portfolios. What is our scoring all about? PAA is, in essence, a scoring model. Why? Well, most customers have asked us, can we just make the decision based upon some simple numbers? Well, yes, you can. We've devised a simple statistical model to drive your decisions. Think of it as a technical fitness score. Remember, Java's 24 years old. C Sharp is 17 years old. So you really never know what you'll find. The scale is between 0 bad and 10 good. Simple enough, right? 
Somewhere around five, your decision teeters between PAS and PKS, but maybe PKS is your first and only destination. Then think of the score as a deployment complexity indicator. We've done some statistical and mathematical gymnastics to compensate for some nonlinear traits. Nothing you have to worry about, it just works, the simple 10-point scale. Higher scores indicate apps are closer to cloud native with less effort. Lower scores indicate more effort to get to cloud native. Below a threshold, say around five or six, PKS might be a better destination. And most applications are gonna score between four and 10. For PAS, the score indicates the amount of remediation required to move toward cloud native. That just means you have to fix some code to move toward cloud native. Not necessarily all the fixes, it sort of depends upon your 12-factor ambitions. For PKS, the score indicates the amount of accommodation, such as persistent I.O. and other non-ephemeral behaviors. Accommodation, that just means your deployments on Kubernetes may be more complex, that's all. So here's the idea. Everything is a trade-off, right? The rich detail provided by PAA will guide your decision. The trick is make an informed decision. Don't play a hunt. And where possible, factor in the business value. And you can assign that business value a score of 1 to 10 in PAA's user interface. When you imagine your portfolio, you may see the faces of those who use and maintain the applications. Maybe you also have a line of business point of view, each with their own list of challenges. With PAA, we just need your repositories cloned into a directory structure. Although we look primarily at source code such as Java and C Sharp, we prefer to have everything because many of our rules are directed toward configuration files. So now I'm here in a directory that has several applications that have been cloned. I'll just do a list. And basically we have applications one through eight. That's what we're gonna be scanning here. And as, just to show you the kind of directory structure we have, I'm going to do a tree. And you'll see that we have quite a deep uh, level of directory structure here with many, many different types of uh, files. So this is the type of directory structure we'd like to see because we'd like to be able to know that we're looking at the entirety of the source code in all the configuration files. Here's the one executable that we'll use. It's called Forge. We're going to call it with the dash H, which is for help. And you can see. There's very many options that we have to choose from. We can't go into them all in this broad overview, uh, but there they are. The one command that we're really more interested in is uh, this command here, and we're going to run it in just a moment. And basically, this is telling Forge to process the current directory. And using the P flag, we're telling Forge to consider every subdirectory in this directory as an application within your portfolio. So let's go ahead and run that. So let's begin the analysis by running Forge with the P flag on the current directory. You'll notice it goes through and immediately counts all the files in each individual subdirectory and gives us that count. And then it begins its analysis on each individual application. And you'll notice as it gets further and further along in the process, the CPUs become more and more saturated. By leveraging and harnessing all those CPUs in parallel is how we're able to process so many files and so many applications in such a short amount of time. So now we're at the end of the run. You'll notice some additional output has appeared. It's giving us some configuration information about where the rules directories are and where the database is kept. It's actually a SQLite uh, database where it keeps everything. Uh, some performance, uh, some counts, and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, if we scroll up here, we'll see we have all the individual, if you, if you never really wanted to go into the user interface, you could see a lot of the findings, top level findings here. We have the scores, the file counts, the uh, software lines of code counts, a general recommendation right here at the, uh, at the command line. So we don't necessarily have to open up uh, the user interface, the, the GUI, to understand uh, what, what was the results of the, uh, of the outcome. And we can kind of scroll up here and we'll get uh, additional information about the different types of languages that it found, the number of files, number of comments, number of lines of code. And here's where we left off uh, before now, all the different uh, applications it's processing, uh, the amount of time it took to processing, and just some general information about the app. Now that we've processed the portfolio, let's launch the browser-based visualization tool. 
So the summary view is the view that we land on when we first enter into the visualization. We have some statistics across the top here indicating the number of applications, the lines of code, the number of files, and the total number of findings. And then as we go down here to, the, to this table, this lists all the applications, each with their own row. That indicates lines of code, number of files, their raw score, the scoring model, the technical score, the business value, the business domain, and the recommendation. Now, the recommendation comes basically from how the application placed on this uh, horizontal and vertical axis here, where the vertical uh, horizontal axis is technical fitness, the vertical axis is business value, and as they land over here in the top right hand corner, probably better candidates for PAS if you're deciding between PAS and PKS. Or if you're only going to PKS, these are the ones that will have the most simplest uh, deployment manifest. As they move down here toward the left, if you're making a decision between PKS and, and PAS, this is where the ones you might want to consider for PKS. If you're going to go to PKS, um, th this, this will indicate uh, that the manifest would be a little bit more complex, uh, given the score. And if we go over here to the charts, the charts is just basically a way of looking at a lot of information in a more simpler format. And this particular format, if we hover over here, you can see how the app applications ended up uh, falling into the different recommendations. The portfolio view allows us to look across all the applications in your portfolio, concentrating on the languages and the API calls. The top half here gives us the list of all the top five languages. And if we hover over, we can get a little bit more detailed information. And similarly, uh, the top five API calls across all the applications in your portfolio. And if we go down here, we're able to select uh, various different languages to see how they're distributed across the portfolio. Let's say it's like JavaScript, and that gives us uh, that distribution, which applications have the most JavaScript. In a similar fashion, we can come over here and let's say we want to look at JPA and how it's distributed across all the applications in your portfolio. So this gives you a, yet another different viewpoint to allow you to understand the kind of work that's going to be involved in moving the applications into the cloud. The application view is likely where you'll spend most of your time analyzing your applications because it tells you specifically what is the anatomy of a particular application Generally up top here, we're allowed to select a particular application. Uh, it shows us the lines of code, uh, the number of files. This is a fairly small application. Uh, and then it allows us to come up here and look at application archetypes. So archetype simply means, uh, a, well, a batch of applications seems to have a particular assortment of calls to ETL. And here we see we have quite a few uh, ETL findings here with the Mule API. And also, if we select caching, it shows us all the different um, technologies that could be involved in the caching. Uh, and data, it'll give us uh, all the different um, API calls that uh, indicate they might be involved in data. So this is a way to uh, keep exploring and drilling down into the application to see the different dimensions of it. It gives us the breakdown of the score. Some scores are info only. We have low, medium, and high, and a total over here. And, and then the, uh, the, the score over here. So this gives us a way of exploring and understanding the kind of work that we're going to be facing. We can drill down. We see we have a lot of ETL, caching, and I.O. going on here, something that we want be, to be concerned with, indicating there might be some issues with the uh, ephemeral nature of the, um, of the application. We'll want to investigate those. So this is a, the view that you'll spend a good deal of your time in. At the very lowest level, we have the data view. All the visualizations we've seen so far and the summary data that we've seen so far came from the low-level information found in this view. First tab we have is the API by app. Here we have a grid of applications and the different API calls and how they're distributed across those applications. So you had a particular interest in an API call and how you resolve, for instance, uh, say I.O., uh, then you can see where most of the I.O. commands were occurring. The API usage detail is the very lowest level down to the line number and the file number that you would have to go to to find a way to remediate the application issue that it found. 
at the API usage summary level, we have from top to bottom, the most to least, the different categories of APIs that we found. Uh, sometimes we look for serious annotations. We found none here. We look for third-party libraries. You might already know that a third-party library will not behave itself in the cloud, so this is where you go to look. A summary of your source code, so you can see all the different material making up every application. And then all findings, which contains every single finding across all the different categories of findings. So this is a very lowest level. You might pursue an issue that you find at a summary level view down to this level and do some sorting and searching to find out the a way to remediate the issue. So back to the summary view. That does it for our demonstration today. Please contact your Pivotal representative for additional information. Thank you.